Welcome everybody. This is the third lecture in my series on purification, ethics and karma in early Buddhist discourse. As usual, I start with uh, some small announcement I would like to make about the blogs. First of all, I uh, I'm very grateful. I really appreciate that uh, several of you uh, using the blog have used the option under home and settings to add a picture. It is uh, still a little unusual for me. I still have to get used to be uh, sitting just in front of a computer instead of sitting in front of a group of people. And so if you go through the effort of adding a picture of yourself in the blog, then that makes it very nice for me. It gives me some, some feeling of uh, personal connection. So I really appreciate that. Then another thing was one of uh, uh, those on the blog had asked for a copy of one of my articles the one on Anatta Pindika. Now, I, I, I thought about it a little bit. I mean, obviously I write because I want all of you to read this, but some articles I, uh, I am uh, restricted by copyright conditions. I can't just put them online. So for this Anatta Pindika article, which is on the, on the topic of teachings to laity, in fact, uh, the, the point that really called up my interest is that in this discourse there is this Anatta Pinnika who is perhaps the foremost lay supporter of early Buddhism. He is always there to help them and support. He is the founder of a very important place where the Buddha often stayed, the Jeta's Grove, which he is supposed to have bought by spreading gold on the ground. The Sanata Pindika is on his deathbed and he, he gets a, an inside teaching and at the end of the teaching he's in tears. And when the monks ask him why he is crying, he says, look, I never, I have always been supporting you, but I never got such teachings before. And I wanted to, I wanted to find out if, if there's a pattern behind that because it doesn't seem to fit very much with what I see in general in the early discourses where teachings on insight are freely dispensed to laity. So if any of you is interested in this article, what I thought what we could do is that you could send me an email requesting a PDF of that article. There's this uh, email address that we have created specifically for this course, the Google Madhyama Agama, or obviously if you have my personal address, you can use that. But most of you have gotten the confirmation on this course through this Madhyama Agama Google address. So what you could do is just send an email and in the under, what do you call this, this topics, you just put Anatta Pindika article. Here I put it in the chat. So if just that much is there, then I, in a few days time, I just collect all those who want a copy of that article and I send you a PDF. In that way I can, I can, I can share the article with you, which is what I really like to do. But at the same time, I keep to this uh, code of conduct, or how shall I call it, that is expected of me in not just putting it out on the website, even it is a restricted website with password access, but I think the editor of the journal would not be happy if he sees that. So I think this is the best solution. And then there's uh, another thing. There's a little technical issue with these blog entries. Uh, I think I mentioned that last time already that when we put new blogs, then the older entries disappear. And now I found out where we can find the older ones. It's a, it's a little complicated, but <laughs> I finally understood. And 
uh, unfortunately I'm not in a position to change this but there's a there's a small on the top right side of the blocks there's a small number saying 2011 and under, th under that it says April and March and in bracket this gives the numbers of blog entries that have been created during that time so if you click on this 2011 or on April or March what happened is that only after clicking that at the bottom of all these blog entries then a link becomes visible and that says all the entries so if you then go down to this all the entries link and click on that you can also see the former blog entries I apologize for this uh, roundabout way but uh, with these technical things I'm just innocent <laughs> yeah so these were just a uh, few kind of um, announcements I wanted to make so now we briefly have a look at the discourses we saw last time and at some of the interesting questions and comments that came up from the blog and after that we go into the next discourses so the first one discourse that we had uh, last time was about that simile of the border town where we had uh, seven uh, qualities compared to various aspects of this border town and then we had four illustrations of the absorptions now there is one comment by Linda Grace so Linda says about these different seven, these seven different qualities although they all help and support each other sometimes one or more is more predominant than others and can even help ones that may be weaker for example uh, to follow the metaphor if the moat is perhaps not as deep and wide as it needs to be in a particular instance and a particularly devious and disguised unwholesome force invades which the troops also miss perhaps the gatekeeper is really on the job and can detect it and deter or overcome it it may be that also helps me see the mode needs some attention as well etc or another example for me is thinking about study and learning the Dhamma in terms of the metaphors part of the armory of spears and sword which has been such a big part of my practice and goes hand in hand with meditation and other aspects of practice sometimes my meditation practice might seem like it's on a plateau so to speak and the study aspect seems stronger or vice versa but ultimately they feed and nourish and depend each other and they have to work together I thought that was a very very nice way of, of putting these uh, seven qualities together then there was a comment by Laura de Bernardi and she is commenting particularly on the quality that we have here is number two the quality of shame she says I find it fascinating uh, to consider that Buddhism's understanding of shame as a moat a state of mind that is productive and useful is radically different to Western psychological and perhaps even Christian attitudes to shame as negative and essentially destructive of well-being from a perspective of personal relevance working with just this issue of shame alone could be incredibly powerful that is deconstructing negative perceptions of it and working with it as a positive and wholesome force I find that extraordinary freeling yeah that was very interesting for me because I have to I have to admit that I'm so immersed in this uh, Third world of Buddhism and early Buddhists that I am not really aware of uh, the way how certain terms are used or what connotations they carry in a in a like Christian context. Yeah, this the sense of shame is, is evidently a very positive quality. 
it's it's not so much uh, wallowing in a feeling of guilt, but more this 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 sense of that prevents me from doing something. Yeah, I found that just very interesting. Then there was a comment by Danya Percy. Ah, there's a question by Jan. I just wait for that question to come. Jan says, I think we have it strongly in Christianity too. Just we have to understand it correctly, but mostly is missing, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, if I understand correctly, then uh, shame in Christian thought is not necessarily uh, to be seen as something negative, but it is more like the usual connotation that that goes with it that uh, Laura de Bernardi was was pointing at yeah I'm, I'm just at a, at a, at a loss as, as, as soon as we get outside of Buddhism I'm just pretty much lost <laughs> and I have to rely on you to tell me what's what's up There are several people typing, so I wait for their comments to come. <laughs> so Jan just says that we can, we, we keep staying with Buddhism. Two more comments are coming. So Linda said, to put someone to shame, as the idiom goes, is generally in a negative sense, I believe, as it seems to indicate that the one who put another to shame is free of the negativity himself. This isn't the right word, but I can't find it at the moment. Yeah, but to put someone to shame ha ha definitely has a negative connotation, yeah. One more comment coming from Hedwig. Christianity is often putting things in a negative way that is this or that is forbidden. In Buddhism we find it often seen from the positive way. Mm -hmm. Good after. Oh, Andrew is also going to add something.
Andrew says, I think some may also misunderstand the meanings of shame in Buddhism. It's a positive and active factor, not negative. So, thank you, all of you, for these comments on shame. And now I come to another of these seven qualities with the comment made by Dania Percy. She says, Right mindfulness follows nicely after the fifth point of studying widely and much. Mm -hmm. We have here number six is mindfulness and number five is wide learning. She says, I know that when I listen to or read the Dhamma, I automatically get enthusiasm for practice and it automatically guides my mindfulness in accordance with the teachings, like a gatekeeper. If one has faith at the beginning, then when one listens to the Dhamma attentively and since one values the teachings due to faith, the teachings will automatically be recalled mindfulness and guide the practice, right effort. Shame and fear of wrongdoing also seem like a natural consequence of the initial faith in the Buddha, since one has an ideal to live up, like in the first sutta we read, we don't want to stray off the path. I thought that was also a very nice uh, and pertinent comment that I wanted to share with you. Now, um, coming to the second part of uh, uh, this uh, third discourse, where we have the comparison between the absorptions and different types of provisions, there's a question that came up from several uh, students and participants in the course about the jhana controversy. Michael Dove uh, mentioned that and Hedwig Krenn also said she likes me to say something more on that. And then there was a short comment by Darshana Makavita, which I now paste in for everybody to read. Darshana says, I feel that considering the numerous times the jhanas are mentioned in the Pali Canon, they must be an integral part of realizing the Dhamma. Yeah, I, I, I certainly fully agree with that. So, um, I admit I have been very short on this topic last time and this is uh, because I have uh, written on that in more detail in my uh, Satipatthana book. This is my uh, my PhD dissertation. I, I have a copy here, maybe this is visible with the camera, yeah, more or less. <laughs> this is the um, Windhorse copy and that was published in 2003. And there's one uh, sub-chapter entitled Absorption Realization, starts on page uh, 79. And somehow I have this uh, this conceit that because I've already written about it a long time ago, I don't need to say anything anymore. <laughs> but that is just my conceit. So I, I, I think I should still uh, briefly say something on this. Basically, there is uh, considerable controversy about the importance of uh, jhana or absorption attainment uh, for being able to reach awakening. And... Um, the Pali commentarial tradition takes the position that it is possible to become even an arahant, which is the highest of the four stages of awakening, without any jhana attainment. This is the called, so-called uh, dry inside Sukha Vipassaka approach. Somebody who only develops uh, vipassana meditation, and in that way, is he or she is able to go all the way to full awakening. And then on the other side, there are uh, some teachers that suggest uh, that even for the attainment of a stream entry, uh, there uh, it is necessary to develop jhanas before. There are basically uh, two main things that have brought me to my position, which I just explain, and then you're perfectly free to reject it and take uh, whatever position you feel uh, is better. The first uh, argument that I would make against the commentary presentation is precisely what Darshana said. 
the jhanas and uh, their nature, the way to attain them is such a central theme in the discourses. And this holds for the Pali Nikayas, for the Chinese parallels, etc. That it seems difficult to conceive that they should be simply irrelevant for progress to full awakening. So they, they must play a considerable role and in fact the eighth factor of the Eightfold Noble Path is right concentration. And in the Pali discourses, right concentration is usually defined by way of jhana. There is some small difference in the Chinese Agama versions, but they usually also speak of jhana, though not necessarily of all four. On the other side, the idea that stream entry requires jhana attainment, uh, I also do not uh, fully share that position. The thing is, uh, first of all, this is never explicitly stipulated, but uh, my main argument here would be in terms of uh, what is the nature of a stream enterer and a once returner. You see the, the, the going first for the once returner, uh, this is the second of the stages of awakening recognized in early Buddhism. A once returner is called once returner because he or she returns once to this world, Imang Lokang. It must mean Lokang, I'm sorry. So this world here refers to the sensual sphere. And uh, of uh, stream enterers, we uh, get a uh, distinction between uh, three types in some discourses. There is one who is called an Eka Biji, a one seeder. This is a very diligent stream enterer who is able to progress further to full awakening within only one future life. And this is explicitly said to take place in the human realm. Then we have the Kolankola. Uh, he takes uh, two, three, four lives, not sure about the precise number, and uh, he or she is faring from cola to cola, from, from, from family or clan to family or clan, again, reborn in the human realm. And we have the uh, stream enterer who takes uh, seven lives to uh, make an end of dukkha, and these seven lives are said to take place among devas or humans. So, if all stream enterers and all once returners would be jhana attainers, a jhana attainer will not be reborn in the human realm, will not be reborn in this world, in the sensual world, even the sensual heavens, but will be reborn in the Brahma world. These basic definitions of a stream enterer and a once returner would simply make no sense. The once returner would never return to this world the stream enterer would not be reborn in a human family. So it seems to me without going into detailed discussions of particular discourses, just this basic aspects of the teaching, uh, this distinction between two lower stages of awakening uh, whose attainees are then reborn in a world that is far inferior to the type of rebirth to be expected of a jhana attainer, but on the other side, the importance and frequency of jhana attainment in the discourses, I come to the conclusion that the lower two stages of awakening do not necessarily require jhana attainment. Anyway, if you wish, you could read up on this more in detail in my Satipatthana book. And I would also like to conclude on this topic with one more point that, interestingly, this discussion is a modern discussion. And we usually find that this is those who uh, like to teach Vipassana will argue that this is all one needs. And uh, concentration is a byproduct of insight meditation. And those who teach jhana will say that this is uh, what is required and insight is a kind of byproduct of uh, deeper concentration. 
but what I find on reading the discourses is rather that the two basic qualities of tranquility and insight need to be both developed. There are differences on which of the two needs to be put into first place and mental tranquility is not seen as only jhana but the basic fact of mental tranquility in the sense of practicing the Brahma Viharas or any other type of meditation practice that is aimed at deepening concentration that this is a necessary aspect of practice is never lost out of sight but we do not get precise stipulation now first you need to do this and when you've gotten that far then you do the other in fact according to one discourse now I'm getting to one particular passage, the Yuganada Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, where we have a parallel in the Samyukta Agama in Chinese. The Venerable Ananda says that all those who have reached awakening have done so, uh, and he says either they have done first Samatha, mental tranquility, and then inside Vipassana, or they have done first inside and then tranquility, or they have practiced both together but he does not envisage that anybody by doing only vipassana or only samatha uh, comes reaches the final goal so my personal uh, idea on the situation in the early discourses is that these are two mental qualities actually not not so much techniques of meditation but mental qualities that both need to be developed but for the breakthrough to awakening, the first breakthrough, uh, stream entry, it is not necessary that this quality of mental tranquility is developed up to the stage of jhana attainment. So, <clears throat> I wanted to be short, but <clears throat> I'm getting a little longer. <laughs> yeah, then um, the Madhyama Agama 4, briefly on the Maybe I should, should I ask if there's any further questions on this issue about jhana and awakening? Could then I go for the, uh, we had the second discourse that we looked at <coughs> It's the one that has that simile on lying in water. And uh, in a discussion with Dania Percy on the blog, we already saw again these, these, these three main ideas that the discourse gives us, this being immersed in the water, being carried away by defilements. And then when we are able to to keep our, our nose above the water, to keep standing, that means we have established our morality. And then we get the vision that is here the one who observes the stream enter, he or she has had the first vision of nirvana. But the it is only with the non return that the father bank is reached, that one is out of the sensual realm. And there was one comment by Hedwig that I would like to share with you. She says, One only remains with the head above the water when one becomes truly part of the Dhamma, really practicing morality. So for me, the Sutra stresses the importance of sila or morality for staying on the path. Stream entry is only possible with perfect moral conduct then one is able to observe and see the other shore. I thought that was also a very, very nice and pertinent comment that I wanted to share with you. So there's time now for some questions or remarks on uh, my revision of Madhyama Agama 3 and 4 and for that time I still leave our PDF visible and then we will go to the next discourse. There's a question by Linda. What is the difference between a non-returner and an arahant? 
Yeah, that's actually a good question. Maybe I should. Yeah, I should maybe reply to that right away. So the uh, the the attainment of awakening in the in the in the early discourses is uh, correlated with uh, three with ten fetters, and um, we find that these four stages of awakening there is a there's there's kind of a gap between the first two stream entry and once return and the second to non-return and aranship. Somehow there are certain practices which are said to lead to this only to these two higher ones have a particular potential for that and there is also a, a, a somewhat a, a, a gap in, in, in practice I think. But the basic point is that like a stream enter has overcome three fetters is a personality view, the idea that there is a substantial self behind existence. These are doubt about what is unwholesome and what is wholesome. And this is uh, holding on to uh, certain rites, rituals, observances in, I think we discussed it in the last session. Then the once returner has diminished sensual desire and ill will to some degree. And uh, the uh, non-returner has completely done with them. But there are still uh, some five more fetters that need to be eradicated before it goes all the way up to full awakening. And this are craving for fine material existence and for immaterial existence. These are the types of realms that correspond to the attainment of jhanas and to the immaterial attainments. Then there's conceit. Mana. There is uh, restlessness and there is a remainder of ignorance. So these are finer defilements, more subtle defilements that mark the difference between an ar a non return and an arahant. I think that is so then we'll go to the next one. This is a very fiery discourse, a very strong discourse. It's the discourse on the simile of the heap of wood. The parallel is the Agi Kandopama Sutta among the seventh of the Anguttara. <coughs> Thus have I heard, at one time the Buddha, while dwelling among the people of Kosala, was traveling accompanied by a great gathering of monks. At that time the Blessed One, while on the road, suddenly saw in a certain place a great heap of wood, all ablaze, intensely hot. On seeing it, the Blessed One went down from the side of the road, spread his sitting mat under a tree and sat down cross-legged. Having seated himself, the Blessed One addressed the monks. Do you see that great heap of wood all ablaze intensely hot? The monks answered, We see it, Blessed One. The Blessed One said to the monks, What do you think, to embrace or to sit? or to lie beside that great heap of wood, all ablaze, intensely hot, or to embrace or to sit or lie beside a woman from the warrior, Brahmin, merchant or worker caste, a woman who is in the full bloom of youth, who has bathed and perfumed herself, has put on bright, clean clothes, is wearing garlands, and has adorned her body with jeweled necklaces. Which of these two would be the more pleasurable? And the monks answered, Blessed one, to embrace or to sit or to lie beside that great heap of wood, all ablaze, intensely hot, that would be very painful. Blessed one, to embrace or to sit or lie beside a woman from the warrior, Brahmin and merchant caste, etc., it would be very pleasurable. Now here comes the Buddha's reply, I tell you, while training as a recluse, do not lose the path of the recluse. If you wish to perfect the holy life, 
it would be better to embrace that grey heap of wood all ablaze, intensely hot, or to sit or lie beside it. Although one would, because of that, experience suffering or even death, yet one would not, when the body breaks up and life ends, go to a bad worm and be born in hell. If an ignorant person violates the precepts and is lax, giving rise to evil and unwholesome states, not practicing the holy life, though professing to practice it, not a recluse, though professing to be a recluse, if he embraces or sits or lies beside a woman from the warrior, Brahmin, merchant or walker caste, who is in the full bloom of her youth, etc., that ignorant person will, because of this unwholesome and unbeneficial conduct, experience the fruits of his evil states for a long time. When the body breaks up and life ends, he will go to a bad realm of existence and be born in hell. For this reason you should contemplate your own benefit, the benefit of others and the benefit of both, reflecting thus. My leaving the household life to train is not in vain, not empty. It has results and fruits that are very agreeable, leading to a long life and to rebirth in good realms of existence. I accept from people as offerings made in faith, robes, food, drink, bed, bedding and medicine. May all those donors obtain great merit, great reward, great splendor. You should train like this. The Pali version is very similar. There is only this uh, reflection, uh, you should contemplate your own benefit, the benefit of others and the benefit of both is not found. <coughs> Yeah, and the discourse continues in the same with the same pattern for several other images. Uh, so one of these is to to cut through the flesh with a hair rope. That seems to be a kind of rope that is very can can cut through flesh. Uh, uh, is co uh, compared to getting a massage, and here the Pali differs. It has receiving homage. Then the next image is cutting off one's legs with a knife uh, or receiving homage and respect. Then wrapping one's body in burning iron sheet or receiving robes. Then having a hot iron ball put into one's mouth or tasty food. Then to be forcefully placed on burning iron bed or to get bedding and then to be thrown into hot cauldron or getting a dwelling place. And uh, the discourse informs us that as this teaching was being given, 60 monks were liberated from the fetters through cessation of the taints, that is, they became arahants. And another 60 monks gave up the precepts and returned to the household life. Why is that? The Blessed One's teachings and admonishment was profound and very difficult, and training in the path is also profound and very difficult. This is what the Buddha said. Having heard the Buddha's words, the monks were delighted and remembered them well. Yeah, the um, Pali version also adds that uh, besides the 60 monks that were became Arahans and the 60 monks that gave up uh, uh, the life of a monk and returned to household life, another 60 monks had hot blood coming out of their mouth. And uh, even though this is not found in the Madhyama Agama version, <coughs> I did a little research on this, on this notion of having hot blood coming out of one's mouth. And I found... Uh, several other instances. One of these instances is found in the in the Vinaya. <coughs> Maybe I just paste in the page references every time as I talk, then you can check this up if you like. Uh, there is the 
Sanjaya, this is one of uh, six well-known uh, teachers contemporary to the Buddha in the discourses and he had two disciples and these disciples left him to join the Buddha. This is Sariputta and Mahamogalana. So when these chief disciples leave him, he has uh, hot blood coming out of his mouth. And we have the same thing. <coughs> this is another passage. The abbreviations refer to the Vinaya. This is a volume page and line references I give. This is Devadatta. Devadatta is the... Uh, someone who, according to the sources, tried to create a schism in the early Buddhist uh, monastic community and uh, a group of monks uh, followed him. And then Sariputta and Mahamogalana uh, also joined this group and Devadatta thought they had also gone over to him. But the story goes that as soon as he uh, was not there, I think he had taken a nap, Sariputta and Mahamogalana give these other monks uh, discourse and convince them to return to the Buddha. So when Devadatta finds out that all his, uh, most, mostly all of his disciples have left him and returned to the Buddha, he also vomits blood. Then we have a reference to the vomiting of blood in the Majjhimanikaya. <coughs> this is... Um, not a real event that is happening. It's just that uh, uh, somebody in Satchaka, he's a debater, he is there in discussion with the Buddha. He just says that some people are practicing in an unbalanced way and they, they, they get mentally deranged and then they, they vomit blood. And the last one is in the Majjhima Nikaya in the Jivaka Sutta and it's Majjhima Agama parallel where a follower of the giants converts to Buddhism and there the leader of the giants vomits blood on, on finding that out. So my conclusion is that uh, uh, vomiting of blood appears to be a physical reaction to a severe psychic shock. However, this shock need not be fatal. That all these people did not pass away on vomiting blood. This is just to, to provide some background to what we have in the Pali discourse. And another small difference is that <coughs> in the Madhyama Agama version it is the narrators of the discourse who say that the Buddhist teaching is difficult and in the Anguttara Nikaya it is the monks who disrobe who think that the Buddha's teaching is difficult, which I think makes a lot of sense. So, if we come to the main points, this is a very stern discourse, and uh, I think it is really meant for monastics this time, <laughs> uh, about our, our, the, our need to be conscious of the effort other people make to support us and to to, to, to act accordingly, to be very clear uh, on the need of uh, maintaining uh, uh, the morality that we proclaim to possess by being monks or nuns. And so we have the, the image of the girl, it's like embracing fire. We have the qualities two and three. I said before there are some differences. Quality 2 in the Chinese version has getting a massage, which I find a little unusual an idea for monastic. But then the Anguttara has received homage, but it has receiving homage also for the third quality. So with, with both versions I am a little, a little unsure. Let us just subsume it all under under homage, uh, is, uh, it is better to get one's limbs cut and receiving robes, it's better to uh, be wearing iron, burning iron sheets than to be wearing robes and uh, um, be of evil conduct. And then the getting tasty food, the image we get is a burning iron ball that is put into the mouth and 
I think this is also one of the hell torches in an, in another discourse. So it's really described how the burning iron boil, it burns the tongue, it burns the the throat, it burns the stomach, it burns the intestine, and it comes out still burning. And the bedding is compared to a hot iron bed and the dwelling place to a hot cauldron. Yeah. So now time for any comments or questions on this rather stark discourse and the image. Robert, <clears throat> for me it is not understandable at first why the Buddha suggests that one would suffer for a long time after receiving robes. Just receiving them should not be against any moral rules. Maybe the Buddha is drawing this picture to puzzle the reader. Maybe he wants to stress the danger of desire. Uh, I, the way I understand the discourse is that uh, this receiving of robes is done by an immoral person, by somebody who is not keeping the precepts. So we have here the case of a monk or a nun who is uh, breaking the precepts, who is uh, engaging in sexual conduct that they are not supposed to be and uh, they are pretending to be celibates without being it. And on this pretension, they are receiving robes. And in that case, it would be better for them if they, if they would dress, if I may use that expression, if they would dress in, in burning iron instead of dressing in those robes. There's a comment by Manfred. It seems at that time only a third of the monks were an unsurpassing field of merit. It hasn't gotten better in the meantime. No comment on my side on this. <laughs> yeah, if there's no further comment by you, then I would go to the next discourse. Yeah. Yeah, this is the discourse on the destinations of a good person. This is actually all about non-returners. So it is very good that Linda asked that question before. <coughs> it's the parallel to the Purisagati Sutta. This is a very, very soothing discourse after this fiery admonition that we have just gone through. So the Buddha is staying at Savati. And he tells the monks, I shall teach you about the seven destinations of good persons and about nirvana without remainder. Listen closely, listen closely and pay careful attention. The monks listened to receive instruction. The Buddha said, What are the seven? A monk practices thus. There is no self, nor is there anything belonging to a self. In the future, there will be no self and nothing belonging to a self. What has already come to exist will be abundant. When it has been abundant, equanimity will be attained. I shall be neither defiled by delight in existence, nor attached to contact through the senses. The insight reflection in the Anguttara parallel is worded a little differently, but I think the main import of not-self or, if you like, emptiness is the same. I continue with the discourse. Such a practitioner sees the unsurpassable state of peace through his wisdom, but has not yet attained final realization. Practicing thus, to which destination will such a monk go? 
It is just like a burning wheat husk, which, having caught fire, quickly exhausts itself. You should know that this monk is like that. Having cut off the five lower fetters, but with a remnant of conceit not yet extinguished, he attains final nirvana, immediately after entering the intermediate state of existence. This is the first destination of good persons, who are indeed to be found in the world. Yeah, the first simile of the wheat husk is also not found in the Pali parallel, but now we come to another series of similes that are also there in the, in the Pali version. <coughs> so the next simile, it is just as when a slab of iron that is all ablaze, intensely hot, is hit with a hammer. A burning splinter flies up into the air, but on moving upwards becomes extinguished immediately. You should know that this monk is like that. Having cut off the five lower fetters, but with a remnant of conceit not yet extinguished, he attains final nirvana after a short while spent in the intermediate state of existence. This is the second destination of good persons really to be found in the world. The next. It is just as when a slab of iron that is all ablaze intensely hot is hit with a hammer and a burning splinter flies up into the air which having moved upwards comes back down but becomes extinguished before hitting the ground. You should know that this monk is like that. Having cut off the five lower fetters, but with a remnant of conceit not yet extinguished, he attains final nirvana after spending some time in the intermediate state of existence. This is the third destination of good persons really to be found in the world. In the next, it is just as when a slab of iron that is all ablaze intensely hot is hit with a hammer, and the burning splinter flies up into the air and becomes extinguished on hitting the ground. You should know that this monk is like that. Having cut off the five lower fetters, but with a remnant of conceit not yet extinguished, he attains final nirvana in his next existence. This is the fourth destination of good persons really to be found in the world. Before continuing, I like to draw your attention to the fact that it is only this fourth good person that is actually going for a, a next existence. The previous are attaining final nirvana in an intermediate state of existence. We have uh, the same also in the Pali version. This is interesting in so far as the Theravada tradition, the commentary tradition holds that there is no intermediate existence. According to the Pali commentaries, the moment somebody dies, that moment he or she is reborn in another existence. And uh, we find that uh, other traditions, the northern traditions of Buddhism are different. Uh, they affirm that there is an intermediate uh, state of existence and you might know that in the Tibetan tradition in particular there is uh, considerable concern with this intermediate uh, state of existence. So if we uh, speak from the perspective of the discourses uh, we would have to affirm this against the Pali commentaries that uh, these references here to uh, different types of non-returners uh, clearly suggest that uh, in early Buddhist thought there was this notion that there is a period between death and being reborn. Another reference, and I, I just paste that in for you, is from the Samyutta Nikaya, uh, excuse me, rubbish, Sutta Nipata. Is uh, from the Metta Sutta, which speaks of uh, beings and those who are about to come to be or who are seeking for existence. This is uh, Sutta Nipata 147. I pasted in the Pali Bhutava Sambhavesiva. This also, this references also only makes sense if we suppose that 
it has an intermediate state of existence in mind. And I find this, it is interesting for our perspective what, what will happen when we die, but I also find this <clears throat> interesting on from the perspective of the transmission of the discourses in that the Pali, the Theravadan tradition transmitted uh, these discourses even though they openly contradict uh, central tenet held in the Theravada tradition without changing them. I think this is uh, this is this is one of those points. I believe this point was originally made to me by Bhikkhu Bodhi, actually, so it's not my own insight. One of those points that give us confidence in the attempt of the reciters to transmit uh, uh, the discourses faithfully and not to just change them at whim. There's a comment here by Manfred Wiesberger whether Sambhavesi is an intermediate state of existence. Uh, the reference uh, Sambhavesi is not precisely the word for an intermediate existence. It's a little difficult uh, depending on how you interpret it, but uh, it, the Sambhav is in one who seeks for uh, coming to be, I believe this is Norman's translation, I would have to look this up, but in publications on this intermediate state of existence, the reference to Sambhavesi is usually taken as referring to an intermediate existence. Yeah, And I admit I would find it difficult to make sense of this expression in another way. But maybe I should put together the relevant literature on this. Uh, the Sambhavesi, and the question by Manfred is in the Sutta, what is the Pali word? Sambhavesi is the Pali word in the Sutta. So, I think I continue, yeah? So now the we come back to our our discourse. <clears throat> the, it is just as when a slab of iron that is all ablaze, intensely hot, is hit with a hammer, and a burning splinter flies up into the air and then falls on a small amount of stick and grass, causing it to smoke and burn, and becomes extinguished after that has burnt out. You should know that this monk is like that, having cut off the five lower fetters, but with the remnant of conceit not yet extinguished, he attains final nirvana with effort. This is the fifth destination of good persons, really to be found in the world. It is just as when a slab of iron that is all ablaze, intensely hot, is hit with a hammer, a burning splinter flies up into the air and then falls on a large amount of stick and grass, causing it to smoke and burn, and becomes extinguished after that has burnt out. You should know that this monk is like that, having cut off the five lower fetters, but with the remnant of conceit not yet extinguished. He attains final nirvana without effort. This is the sixth destination of good persons. Such persons are really to be found in the world. I think there is a mistake here in the Chinese version. As you noticed, perhaps the one who does it with effort comes first and the does without effort comes next even though the simile shows that the later mentioned one is, 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 is less advanced and also the image of burning a large amount would better fit the with effort and this is in fact the sequence we get in the Pali version so we have the distinction between two non-returners. One of them makes it to the final goal without effort. And this, I would think, is similar to the small amount of grass. And then the one who has to make, who makes effort to reach the final goal, 
after being reborn in a higher Brahma world. And this is similar to the large amount of stick and grass. And now we come to the last of these seven. <coughs> it is just as when a slab of iron that is all ablaze, intensely hot, is hit with a hammer and a burning splinter flies up into the air and falls onto a large amount of stick and grass, causing it to smoke and burn. And after that has burned, the fire spreads to villages, towns, mountain forests and wilderness. And having burned out the villages, towns, mountain forests and wilderness, it reaches a road or reaches water or reaches level ground and becomes extinguished. You should know that this monk is like that. Having cut off the five lower fetters, but with a remnant of conceit not yet extinguished, he first goes upstream all the way to the Akkanitta realm, where he attains final nirvana. This is the seventh destination of good persons really to be found in the world. And after listing these uh, seven types of non-returners, uh, we now come to the Arahant. What is Nirvana without remainder? And now I want more time to give uh, the whole passage. <clears throat> Among practices thus, there is no self, nor is there anything belonging to a self. In the future there will be no self and nothing belonging to a self. What has already come to exist will be abundant, and when it has been abundant, equanimity will be attained. I shall be neither defiled by delight existence, nor attached to contact through the senses. Such a practitioner sees the unsurpassable state of peace through wisdom. Having attained final realization, I say, that monk will not go to the east, nor to the west, nor to the south, nor to the north, nor to any of the four intermediate directions, nor above, nor below, but will attain the state of peace, final nirvana, right here and now. When I said earlier, I shall teach you the seven destinations of good persons and nirvana without remainder, it was on account of this that I said it. This is what the Buddha said. Having heard the Buddha's words, the monks were delighted and remembered them well. So the main points that this, this discourse gives us is a, is a grading of non-returners in that they become arahants in between death and rebirth on being reborn with or without exertion or heading towards Akanita. This is Akanita is uh, one of these uh, Brahma worlds, higher heavenly spheres in which Anagamis, non-returners are reborn. But if the same practice is fully done with full realization then no further existence whatsoever. Yeah, is there any any comment or question on this uh, discourse? Uh, there's a comment by Manfred. Jnana Ponika's translation is very different. Da ihr Mönche übt sich ein Mönch, hätte es nicht im früheren Dasein wiedergeboren. I, I let me first read it in German, then I summarize it in English. Yeah, Manfred is giving us a translation of the contemplation that is done in the Pali version. Is a, this is a German translation by Venerable Jnana Ponika. As I said, the two forms of contemplation are somewhat different, but the main input is the same. And Venerable Jnana Ponika's translation follows the commentary gloss on the Antara Parinibhai understanding it as uh, 
for before before having gone through half of one's lifetime. Uh, if you check, Bhikkhu Bodhi has also discussed this, and he disagrees with the commentarial explanation. And I also find this difficult to apply. Venerable Ponika in his translation usually follows the commentarial explanation. So that is why he translates it like this. But I, uh, there's, um, there's considerable publications on this. I'll, I'll put this together for you, Manfred. Uh, Andhra Parinibhai, I really think it's difficult to follow the commentarial explanation, which obviously tries to argue this passage away because it doesn't fit their idea of an interim existence. In, uh, in Buddhist scholarship, to the degree to which I am aware of, <coughs> this is unlike the discussion we had earlier about jhana and stream entry. Uh, uh, this is not a contested issue. Buddhist scholarship pretty much agrees that the early canon accepts the existence of an interim existence and that uh, the references for that is the passage I gave from the Sutta Nipata and the existence of the Antara Parinibhai. But uh, yeah, I think best thing is if I if I just send you references to the relevant publications. Then there is a comment by Linda. She says these are very subtle concepts, and this will require some further consideration and thought. Yeah, good. Then I I just uh, let this stand as it is. But I, I hope that the basic idea has become clear. Yes, Robert. We spoke about the different worlds in which one can be reborn before or during the discussion on the jhanas. <clears throat> this uh, sutta speaks about them again. So they are, these are not figurative speech, but have to be taken literally. Yes, definitely. I think <coughs> the idea of being reborn in heavenly realms and in hell realms in the early discourses, as far as we can tell from the way we have them now, are meant to be taken literal. Not just as uh, symbolic illustrations of certain mental conditions we might go through. I think it is perhaps fair to interpret this as symbolic for one's own practice if one uh, finds these ideas foreign. The notions of different heavens and uh, different hells is something that was a pan-Indic idea at that time. We find that in the parallel uh, Jaina traditions uh, we get similar ideas and the uh, descriptions of hells is also found in Brahminical traditions. But uh, for our appreciation of the early Buddhist teachings, I think it is good to be aware of the fact that as far as we can tell, these are meant to be taken literal. And I have not found any major differences in this respect between the parallel versions. There's one small difference. I remember, I think it is uh, the Deva Dutta or Bala Pandita Sutta. These are two discourses in the Majjhima Nikaya which describe different hell realms. And there is a small difference in so far as in the, I believe it's in the Pali version. Don't, I would have to look it up now. Uh, I believe it's in the Pali version that the Buddha says, and I have seen this with my own eyes. And such a remark is... Uh, if it is the Pali version, then such a remark is not found in the in the Chinese parallels. But otherwise, the description is the same. Robert says, bad conduct can already lead to living hell in this world, but I will accept the concept of these worlds for now. Yeah, I think this is this is very healthy to 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 just uh, Buddhist. Uh, 
early Buddhist teaching is not something we have to just swallow down on belief. And it is meaningful to, to interpret these uh, uh, things in a way that, that makes practical sense without thereby saying necessarily needing to establish that this is the way the early discourses present the matter. I myself, I'm also not particularly uh, keen on the different heavenly realms and the different hell realms in particular. There's also some problems, particularly with the hell realms, as we have their different people who administer torture, the heavenly guardians, and uh, from the perspective of karma, it is not quite clear if that is a if that is a punishment for them also, or if they are incurring karma. There are some discussions in the commentary traditions, I believe, on this. But um, yeah, to, to, to go from a practical perspective, uh, see how a symbolic interpretation at least can definitely make sense for us, practically speaking, but to be aware at the same time that these things were probably, as far as we are able to tell, meant literally. Good, if we have... Then I go for the next. The Discourse on Sources of Worldly Merit. This discourse has no Pali parallel. <coughs> I think I first go through the discourse and then come to the significance of something having a parallel or not. So the Buddha is staying at Kosambi in Gositas Park and the Venerable Mahachunda rose from sitting in meditation approached the Buddha. Mahachunda is one of the main disciples that is not so frequently mentioned in the discourse. He occurs a few times in listing of uh, chief disciples and according to Malala Sekara he has put together a dictionary of proper names that is very useful. There's some confusions about Maha Chunda and then there's also a Chula Chunda and there's a Chunda the, the novice. So we do not have so much of information about him that I could safely give you now. So let us just take him as one of those known disciples of the Buddha. So he comes and he pays his respects and then he asks, Blessed One, is it possible to describe the nature of worldly merit? And the Blessed One answered, It is possible, Chunda. There are seven sources of worldly merit that lead to great merit, great reward, great reputation and great benefit. What are the seven? <clears throat> Chunda, a faithful son or daughter of good family offers a dwelling place or an assembly hall to the community of monks. This Chunda is the first source of worldly merit that leads to great merit, great reward, great reputation and great benefit. So the discourse continues with this faithful son or daughter of a good family offers to those in their dwelling place beds, seats, woolen blankets, felt mattresses or bedding. Or he offers to all of them clean robes of superior quality. Or he or she offers morning rice gruel and the midday meal. Or they provide the monastic park attendants to serve them. Or he or she personally approaches the monastic park to make still more offerings regardless of wind or rain, cold or snow. Or he or she ensures that after the monks have eaten, their robes do not get soaked by wind or rain, cold or snow, so that they can enjoy meditation and quiet reflection by day and by night. I need to add that my separation of these into seven is a little bit by guesswork. The problem is that the Chinese original has uh, abbreviated. They often do that in 
we also get that in the Pali discourses that <clears throat> the same passage is not being repeated over and over again and we just get a P that is a dot 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 in English and we can assume that this was uh, done when the uh, material was written down in those times writing material was sparse they were writing on something like birch bark or material of this type which is difficult to produce and so one tries to just save space and when they render these abbreviations into Chinese then sometimes we are not entirely sure where the abbreviation starts and stops and this is one of those cases but the other editors of the Madhyama Agama translation project agree with my separation so we just leave it at that <clears throat> so Chunda, a faithful son or daughter of good family who has attained these seven sources of worldly merit whether going or coming, whether standing or sitting, whether sleeping or awake whether by day or by night, his or her merit will continuously grow, increase and become more extensive. And now we get a simile. Chunda, just as from its emergence at its source to its entry into the great ocean, the river Ganges becomes increasingly deep and increasingly wide. Now, when Mahachunda gets up, <coughs> He puts his robe on one shoulder as an expression of respect, kneels down with one knee on the ground, puts his arms, its, its, its palms together in a gesture of respect, and asks the Buddha if it, there are also um, a nature of merit that transcends the world. That is, he, after hearing about seven worldly merits, he wants to hear of uh, Lokutara, of supramundane, of transcending merit. And the Blessed One says it is possible and there are also seven sources of merit transcending the world. And then he describes them. Chunda, a faithful son or daughter of good family hears that the Tathagata or a disciple of the Tathagata is staying in a certain place. Having heard this, he or she is delighted and supremely inspired. This Chunda is the first source of merit transcending the world that leads to great merit, great reward, great reputation and great benefit. Then the next is that he, this faithful son or daughter of good family has not heard that, only heard that they are staying in a certain place but hears that they are actually wanting to come here. And on hearing that he or she is delighted and inspired. And then the next is that he or she hears that they have actually come. They have come here. And again, he or she is delighted and supremely inspired. Then the next is that the faithful son or daughter of a good family, they personally goes to see the Tathagata or the disciple of a Tathagata. And they pay respect with a pure mind. And the next is they present offerings to the Tathagata or to a disciple of the Tathagata. And the next is, having paid respects and presented offerings, a faithful son or daughter of good family performs the threefold taking of refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the community of monks. And the last is the faithful son or daughter of a good family takes the precepts. This refers to the five precepts that lay followers of Buddhism observe. This Chunda is the seventh sort of merit transcending the world that leads to great merit, great reward, great reputation and great benefit. Chunda, if a faithful son or daughter of good family attains these seven sources of worldly merit and also these seven sources of merit transcending the world, his or her merit cannot be measured in terms of so much merit, so much fruit of merit, so much result of merit. It just cannot be encompassed, cannot be measured. This great merit cannot be calculated. Chunda, it is just as in this land of Jambudipa, that is India, there are five rivers, the Ganges being reckoned the first, the Yamuna the second, the Sarabhu the third, the Achiravati, the fourth, and the Mahi, the fifth. And on flowing into the great ocean, 
Once inside it, their water cannot be measured as so many gallons. It just cannot be encompassed, cannot be measured. This great water cannot be calculated. The discourse continues with a few verses and then the standard conclusion. <coughs> so the main point that this discourse offers us is a distinction between worldly merit and non-worldly or transcendental merit. And the uh, worldly merit is all about offerings, dwelling place, bedding, robes, food, giving attendance, coming personally to make offerings and to protect the practice of the monks. Transcendental merit is the, is the inspiration. One hears the Tathagata or his disciples stay somewhere, they will come, they have come. Then one goes and meets them and pays respects, one makes some offerings to them, one takes refuge and one takes the precepts. Yeah, I think I first wait if there are any comments or questions on the nature of this discourse and then I would like to just say something briefly on the general significance of uh, the presence or absence of parallels to Pali discourses in the Chinese Agamas. Had we asked so to make offerings is both worldly and transcendental? That's a good question, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I when I originally read this discourse, I was a little puzzled that the offering comes again under transcendental merit. And then I, I the the way the way I make uh, uh, sense out of it is that uh, Transcendental merit of making offerings to the Tathagata is, is coming in this whole, whole, whole context, which is more geared towards practice, towards actually doing something oneself, taking refuge. It culminates in taking refuge and taking the precepts, which which is really the the, the point of 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 a reorientation of one's the priorities of one's lives and uh, the, the, the commitment to, to moral conduct. And so the other steps, they, they kind of lead up to that. And because, as I think you were that, in fact, that on the blog pointed out the importance of morality, that morality in turn is the basis for the progress to awakening. So all this, 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 this seven steps that we get there, they somehow, they, they lead, they lead out whereas uh, the others are forms of activities that are very meritorious and very good but they do not in themselves lead out of the world they 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 they, they stay within the world in the sense of they lead to a better rebirth but they are not in themselves the way they are described here uh, productive of 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 liberation that is the way I understand it, but uh, this is just my, my take on the discourse. Andrew, if you have something, then just hit it in. I can I can see that you're typing, but <clears throat> Andrew says, as far as worldly merits in the sutra, uh, does it say if the recipient sangha need to have a good conducts? I'm comparing this with the previous sutta. 
Yeah, this is not explicitly being said. And um, according to an analysis of uh, gifts uh, given in a discourse in the Majjhima Nikaya, that is uh, number 142, the Dakkhina Vibhanga Sutta, which has parallels in Chinese and also in a Tibetan sutra quotation. The, uh, the, the effectivity of gifts depends on both. It depends on the giver and on the recipient. So if both are virtuous, then the gift will have its maximum effect. But if somebody, uh, if a giver, a sincere, virtuous, practicing person, makes a gift even if the recipient is not a virtuous person, this gift will still be productive of merit. Only difference, obviously, if the recipient would be virtuous, that would be so much the better. So <clears throat> the distinction between giving to virtuous and non-virtuous recipients is not made explicitly in this discourse, but uh, we can see it underlying if you wish. Then there's a comment by Robert. I remember in this uh, context the Sutta on the king that offered tons of gold to the Sangha, which was nothing compared to supporting an Arahant, to supporting the Buddha, the, this was all nothing compared to one minute of true meditation. I think you might uh, have in mind the Velama Sutta, that is a discourse found in the Anguttara Nikaya, <clears throat> which lists uh, different, the fruitfulness of different gifts, and it goes to ever higher gifts and giving a whole monastery to the. Buddha and the community. But then even better than that is if for the time it takes to snap the finger, one uh, were to practice loving kindness. And even more fruitful than this, if for the time it takes to snap a finger, one were to practice perception of impermanence. This discourse also, I looked at it quite some time ago, but uh, I can't often list the parallels, but it has several parallels, so we are on firm ground in that. And it's good you mentioned that because it, it, it's, it, it shows us the same qualitative uh, uh, distinction that I think would also underlie this distinction between worldly and transcendental merit. Andrew gives a reference to Anguttara Nikaya 9.20. <clears throat> Let me see if I find it. can quickly find it. While the others are typing. <laughs> That's a very naughty remark now. Somebody says, Bhante, if you need any bedding robes and food, please let us know. <laughs> <clears throat> oh yeah, 920 is in fact the discourse I have been been talking about the Velama Sutta. So yeah, I just found it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's a question by Hedwig. Uh, the Tathagata has perfect moral conduct. So get transcendental merit. The moral conduct of the receiving person is necessary. Yeah, I, 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 I tried to say that before, maybe I, I, I wasn't entirely clear. There's a, there's a fourfold uh, distinction on the merits uh, that are accrued by a gift. And this depends <clears throat> on the condition of the recipient and of the giver. So if uh, giver and recipient are both uh, of evil conduct, then the gift is uh, very poor. But if at least one of them is established and of pure conduct, then the gift is purified to that extent. But the best is obviously if both of them are pure people, 
And on top of being pure in the moral sense, if the recipient is one of those who has attained one of the stages of awakening, then the gift produces manifold fruit. And the supreme gift is obviously to a Buddha who is not only one who is fully awakened, but also one who has discovered the path and teaches it to others. So I have a little more time now and I think I just want to make a concluding remark on the significance of the absence or presence of parallels. And then tomorrow, uh, sorry, tomorrow, next week, we'll just briefly look at the next discourse. And after that, we finally come to the first of the main topics in this course, to the topic of purification, where we will be looking at the parallel to the Ratavinita Sutta and the seven stages of purification. Now, the presence or absence of a passage in two discourses that are parallel is significant. That is, if I have the same discourse in two versions and they are similar in other respects but one part is missing, then based on that I can really draw conclusions. But <clears throat> the fact that a whole discourse is without a parallel does not in itself allow us to draw conclusions. The reason for that is that whereas in Pali, we have the whole collection of discourses of one tradition. What we have in Chinese or even in Sanskrit fragments is only bits and pieces. Each of the Chinese agamas, as far as our research among scholars goes so far, belongs to a different school. Since the different schools distributed discourses in a different way over their four collections, Sometimes a discourse may have just fallen through. <clears throat> One example for that is the Jivaka Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. This uh, is a discourse that has no Chinese parallel whatsoever. And uh, one scholar uh, earlier had taken this to be uh, rather significant because the Jivaka Sutta stipulates under what conditions monks can accept meat. And he thought that perhaps some vegetarians had uh, uh, are behind the non-existence of this discourse or some other type of explanation of that type. Now, we have recently found uh, Sanskrit fragments from the Mula Savastivada traditions. They have been discovered in Central Asia, and we have a version of this Jivaka Sutra among these Sanskrit fragments. This is in the collection of long discourses, the Dirga Agama. So the situation simply seems to be that in the Sarvastivada tradition, this discourse which in the Theravada tradition is found among the middle long, in the Sarvastivada was put among the long discourse collection. Because this long discourse collection of Mula Sarvastivada or Sarvastivada was not translated into Chinese, we have no Chinese parallel. And the collection of long discourses that has been translated into Chinese is the Dharmaguptaka version. Of the Dhamma Guptaka, we only have this collection of long discourses, so it is quite possible, though we cannot be certain, that this Jivaka Sutta is found in the middle long discourses of the Dhamma Guptakas, which was never translated into Chinese and which we no longer have. This is just to make us aware of the point that a discourse parallel completely absent in any of the parallel existing collections is in itself not necessarily a pointer to this discourse being late or being a fabrication or whatever. It just means we can't we, we, we cannot say very much about it. But that is basically all. Where we, we can draw conclusions on lateness or, or otherwise is when we have otherwise similar discourses where a particular passage is just missing in one version. So, yeah, <laughs> I have gone a little bit over my time limit today. I hope that this uh, 
three uh, very different discourses, the fiery admonition and the non-returners and the merit has been of some interest and I thank you all for your attention and I look forward to seeing you next week again when we get into purification.